Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I'm Ray. I'll be reviewing some recent and classic Lit RPG audiobooks for you today. I'm going to begin with Countdown, Reality Benders, Series Book 1. The author is Michael Adamanov, and the translation is done by Andrew Schmidt. The narrator is Rudy Sanda, and the audiobook length is 12 hours and 29 minutes, and it does feel a little long. I can run through 24-hour books and still feel like it was fresh and going, but there were some draggy points to it, so it does feel like 12 hours. Fortunately, the storm gradually settled, and I wasn't even thrown overboard without a spacesuit. Ura's Tuksh had been screaming about just such a punishment, though. I was even morally prepared to respawn back at my capital base in shame. Over all the screams and commotion, none of the crew even noticed that I had saved the scan in my device's memory. However, my thoughtless action had netted me a highly detailed three-dimensional blueprint of an alien starship. When the captain calmed down and my roommates drifted off, I turned on my scanner and carefully acquainted myself with the saved file. It showed all the key sections of the Shiamiru-class ship along with its control systems and power sources, rooms, corridors, and technical components. Practically every rivet could be seen in my highly detailed 3D model. I had even detected a safe in the wall of the captain's chambers, which looked to contain just over three pounds of platinum and approximately the same quantity of iridium. Naturally, I didn't tell Uraz Tuksh and the other crew members about my discovery because I was afraid the gecko would demand I delete the valuable data. And, by the way, I was very surprised to see that the gecko didn't leave the game that bends reality to rest, seemingly ever. Um, now, when this book first hit the e-shelves on Amazon, I was really upset and jealous because I only listen to Audible. I don't really have a lot of time to read. Uh, I cannot spend time to read, and the few moments that I do have, I try to do reviews so that I can pay back the authors who have given me such joy in my life by listening to books. So I was really stoked when this hit Audible. It sounded like it was right up my alley, and it was going to be like this amazing lit RPG book. So I grabbed it, and I jumped in as soon as I had it, and I saw it all the way through it. I think I did it in about 14 hours with uh, little breaks here and there, and I did that straight in one day. Uh, there are some really, really great things in this book, and there are some hiccups. Um, the bumps, thankfully, don't leave bruises, but they are noticeable. Uh, the writing is decent, but if I hadn't have been told this book had been translated, I'd have known it in about 10 minutes of listening. The writing is decent, but there are times when obviously wrong words are used in place of proper ones, such as, the council anonymously decided. What? They didn't tell anybody what they decided? Rather than using the word unanimously decided. It's like that throughout the book. Little pieces here and there. Not a whole lot of them, but it really throws you out. This made it sound like Archie Bunker or Andy Sipowitz. And if you don't know who those are, go back and look up some pop culture references. I'm not going to explain it to you guys. It's They, they can't speak properly. Um, this makes the, the narration wonky. And it's because the translator is of a mid-level skill. He got the job done, but he took the wrong way getting to where he was going. Also... I would have known that this was written by a Russian, even if the main characters didn't say they were Russian every five minutes. Uh, the whole story, and I mean the whole story, has a very similar vibe or feel to D. Roos's Alter World. Seriously, these two book series could be siblings. Now, the nice thing about this is it's sci-fi and not fantasy, and I enjoy that a lot. I, I Most lit RPG books are fantasy based and that's great i am a huge fantasy buff this is a counterpoint to ultra world sci-fi and science and then you have fantasy and magic so it really counterbalanced each other like i say they could be siblings same parents just different attitudes now one thing that really bothered me with the writing was that the incessant references to the game itself and i mean every time that the game is mentioned in the book that people call it by its full name. You know, if you play World of Warcraft, you don't call it World of Warcraft when you're playing or talking to people. 
you say wow you don't say the elder scrolls skyrim you say i played skyrim no one uses the full name of anything and keeps things nice nicely paced if you do it that way um here every time they referred to this game they would say the game that changes reality or however they worded it rather than just shortening it to the game or the reality benders you know that's the title reality bender you know so we were playing reality bender the other day mm -hmm. so they should have just done that and I, I think again that's the translator's fault he could have toned things down a bit um because no one talks like that anyway rudy sanda does a really fair job with the narration i wasn't blown away by his work and i was disappointed a little bit that he was either too lazy to give the russians a russian accent or he could not do russian accents and glossed over this part of the story it's kind of like listening to a man from india but he speaks like bland american this took me out of story every time he spoke there is no reason why i could not speak with a slight russian accent or give them some sort of voice that would say i drink vodka and i love to drink vodka he did not try he made no effort to even tinge this with a russian accent they're all russians and there are different uh factions in the book that are human that are not russian and there would be no way to distinguish them because even the negative faction that's trying to wipe out everybody else speaks the same way and they're not russian so there's no way to distinguish just from a voice who's who or what team they're on automatically and that just kind of drives me crazy uh the story itself is pretty good although like i say it wanders off in some places basically it revolves on nat who is an uber awesome player that never listens to anyone and just does or does what he's told he always seems to manage to come out ahead. And that's great because everybody in this book loves a winner. The story is pretty simple. Aliens now own the Earth and humans must play the game that changes reality or be destroyed. And if they don't play it right or they tick off their benevolent overlords, they'll be destroyed anyway. If they lose to other gamers, they'll be destroyed. So there's obviously a lot riding on their success, and Nat always seems to be in the right place at the right time and always manages to do the right thing somehow when he needs to. So some issues I took with the game. Your classes were pretty much limited by what you were familiar with, and so you could not pick anything that you wanted. You couldn't just become a fighter or a warrior. If you didn't know how to fire a gun or use a sword, you were going to go back to a, base, uh, a baseline default that would kind of play into what you knew. So if you're a, a store clerk, somehow they're gonna figure out how you can sell and trade items. You're gonna know how to barter or something like that. And it doesn't sound like it'd be very exciting to play, to be frank with you. Uh, so you also had to play as a human and you pretty much start out building your tech from scratch. I mean, these people were not great with, you know, their walkie talkies barely worked. Uh, the funniest thing I noticed was that the game itself posed no threat to Nat. The only time he is ever killed, and I'm not trying to give you a spoiler, but here's the facts. The only time he's ever killed is when his teammates gank him. I mean, hello. Uh, and, and the other thing is, is like I said before, they love winners. So when he should be punished or reprimanded or anything else, because he managed to come through, they overlook everything. And, and it just kind of drove me crazy there. Now, there is a few parts that, that the book does slow down with, and it, particularly when they go into outer space. It, it just drags for a bit. They should have just kind of jumped right in and gone to it, and I understand where the, the stuff came from, but that was kind of a, a low point for me, and that's where the slowest point was in the book. In spite of the flaws, which I just told you about, the book was fun, and I will happily get the next book in the series. So, if you liked Alter World, you will like this book. So don't miss out on the fun. I'm not trying to portray this in a bad light at all. This is a really good book. It does have issues. And the only reason why I'm going to give this a final score of 7.5 is because of the slow points and the sloppy translation and the never fail main character. Because I think that you have to have flaws. And when your main character is Superman and there's no kryptonite, it makes for a really boring story. I mean, it just does not sound exciting. And Nat is not Superman, but I mean, he's pretty close. He's pretty close. So 7.5, but it's still a really good read, or I should say really good listen. 
So don't miss out. I, I think this would be a really fun book to listen to. You should enjoy it, and it's a nice change of pace from the fantasy world. And the next book I want to review is The Bathrobe Night, Volume 3. Authors are Charles Dean and Richard Haygood. Narration is by Matthew Broadhead, and the audiobook length is 10 hours and 34 minutes. Darwin sighed. No, I mean one of my skills is causing me a lot of trouble, he said, trying to finish this time before Daniel could volunteer something more embarrassing or insulting. A class skill? Kitchen's eyes opened wider. Tell me more about it. I have been meaning to select one, but haven't been able to decide. You don't have a class skill yet? McLean's eyes practically popped out of her head as she asked him. How in heaven's name do you do so much damage without one? I just use the same sword art I have been studying for the last twenty years. It seems to do fine on its own, so I haven't felt the need to pick out a skill. Kitchens just shrugged again, as if everything he said were perfectly normal. He hadn't been awesome because of his class, but because of his twenty years of classes. Fuzzy Wuzzy let out a roar of approval and pawed at Kitchen's leg, in the ursine equivalent of a pat on the back. Now here, uh, the bearded lord of bacon and booze and hay good have broken my expectations with the third installment of The Bathroom Night. This is a family-friendly story that my family and I have been listening to since book one came out. We have enjoyed and loved this story. Uh, and I'll give you an example. We all became hooked, and my mistake was... I didn't wait for my kids to listen to this when I started BK3, and my son caught me listening, and he had a complete hissy fit that I had betrayed him by not sharing the new book. We usually listen on like really long trips, but we haven't had anywhere to go for a really long time, and I wanted to get this bad boy reviewed, and not to mention I just couldn't wait to read it. Uh, so I had to swear to him that I would re-listen to the audiobook when we go on our family vacation this August. Uh, and that says a lot about how devoted Dean's listeners and Haygood's listeners can be in the rabid fervor that their writing inspires. Now, in BK3, we finally get to see a few things come to fruition. Uh, Stephanie's plan is revealed, the truth about who Darwin is, what he is, and his people, the demons. That's all thrown out there. You get to finally find out what all this is about. Uh, you get to understand Charles' big idea of what he expects Darwin to do. And Cass does fall into some seriously hard times. Kitchens gets upset that Big D might be looking up his precious flowers dress. And several members of the cast undergo some dramatic changes that you really do not see coming. Dean and Haygood amp this story up. They also let you know how to slow cook it. They know how to make a big pig roast that is amazing. They slow cook this to perfection. There is a ton of action and plenty of killing to go around, but I don't want you to think that it's just like one long pause and then we get some fighting. Uh, he spools out the big picture stuff, okay? It's it's doled out like you were a fish on a hook and he's just they're just wanting you to get tired before reeling you into the net. That's the power of this story. Now my really only concern is that this book as opposed to books one and two. Like, for example, in BK1, uh, there was a spoon in the eye incident, and that's something that we still, to this day, laugh about. In BK2, we deal with what happened to Kaysa on the King. So here, there's no real big moment, nothing that sticks in your mind. No, holy cow, I can't believe this happened, or holy crap, what just occurred. Um, this was just, it was a good book. It was a great book. But there was no standout event. There are some great battle scenes, and the council member encounter might be equivalent to one of those, but it doesn't feel that way. Nor did the encounter between Charles and Darwin, which was cool, but it does not stand out in your mind. Not like I've come to expect from these wordsmiths, okay? Did I like the book any less because of that? No, no, not at all. I, I don't want you to feel that way. I mean, this is a really good book. I just, I've come to expect like a big wow moment or a big laugh uh, to come out of the, 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 you know, out of the woods and smack you upside the head. And we didn't have that. I mean, it, it was, it was a great book, um, but I really wanted like one gut busting or heart wrenching moment. And Cass's big scene, it, it could fit the bill, I suppose, if things had gone a different way, but they didn't. So it was kind of a washout, but not really. 
I just got a great book. It stayed awesome across the board. That's all. I really enjoyed it. Now, Broadhood carries this book on his broad shoulders. And as always, he does a really good job. His voice is, he's always infusing, infusing a scene with emotion. And he plays each character with a dis different and distinctive voice. Now, my youngest son insists that I say this. Um, he, he doesn't feel that, that he does, you know, Broadhead does female voices very well. And he made me swear, swear to say that. Now, I myself have no issue, issues with his renditions of the ladies, particularly Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie was a big standout for us. She really, really became a family favorite uh, early on. As soon as she appeared and she was the Gorgon, uh, we all just loved her. We thought she was funny and, you know, the Valley Girl accent and all that. And I wish she kind of stayed that way, but I understand what's happened to her character and how things have gone since that point. So... He does a really good job, and I, I just want to emphasize that there's no problems with his narration at all. I think he, he does a really, really good job, uh, and, and it's fun. You get to hear some fun in his voice, especially when he does like Stephanie, okay? Uh, this book does not wrap up everything. There is still plenty of story to tell, and it is clear that Darwin's journey is far from over, uh, that Stephanie's plans are only just starting to come to fruition, and Cass finally, finally, finally is waking up and becoming aware of everything that is around her. I truly anticipate the upcoming events and trust that Dean and Haygood will keep us on a fun and exciting road. But I just found out they, they pretty much are not planning on doing uh, the Merchants of Tikba audiobooks and they're not going to be coming back to the series. So I, I just want to say this is an 8 out of 10 for me. I like the book a lot, but not having any future. Um, I think you understand where it's going to go if you've read the first two books and you get to this one. Um, you're going to know where it's at and what's going to happen. Uh, in fact, uh, just you, you kind of have to, to say, I know where it's going to go. But not having it there for certain is kind of annoying. And I know that if, if you really like it and you can read books, uh, unlike me, uh, that where I have to have Audible, um, you can always go and read The Merchants of Tikba, books one and two. And there are some references to things that happen with Darwin throughout, but it's not a Darwin uh, centered book. It's not Dar Darwin centric. So, you know, if you're looking for that, you're going to be a little disappointed. And I'm just coming clean with all honesty here. And I know that, that Dean and Haygood have pretty much said that this is it, but I would really like to see like with, with Rory Turnus picking up. And I really say Rory Turnus is even better than Bathrobe Knight. Uh, but I can see them getting some more fans and maybe doing one more book. I'm hoping Charles and Haygood, uh, you know, you guys, you know, come back to it and complete it with one novel, wrap everything up. I think you could pull that off and make it just amazing. Uh, this book is just incredible. And I hate to see it just kind of go by the wayside because this was my introduction to Charles Dean and, and, and Mr. Haywood. Hey, good. So, um, and my family, we never can find a book that we can listen to all at once all together. My family, even my wife, who does not like to listen to audiobooks, enjoyed this book series. So that says a hell of a lot as to the quality of the narration, of the story writing, everything. The characterizations, it's just, it's intense. And the humor is there. So this is not a series I want to see end this way. I want to see more. And I think we can get this maybe in a couple of years, have Charles and his partner go back and, and nail this down one final time. Um, but that's just me and wishful thinking. But I'm an optimist. And as much as I like to say that, I'm also a realist. And I think that with Rory Turnus taking off the way it is and the way it's building up, uh, I think he'll find a way to unveil something to us that we didn't know. So that's also a possibility as well. Either way, uh, 8 out of 10 points. It would be better if it had uh, a future. But I can't say, you know, this is, is what you want when you know the book is the final book in a series and it does leave some, some things unanswered. So as much as I love this series, I hate to see it end. Uh, and I'm hoping Charles and his partner come back and, and conclude it. Eight out of ten, guys. I'm sorry. You know I'm a huge fan, but i got to be square and honest. All right, so today, finally, we have Cherry Blossom Girls 2, a superhero harem adventure. The author is Harmon Cooper. The narration is done by the cast of Sound Booth Theater, including Justin Thomas James, the man with three first names, Annie Ellicott, Lori 
Catherine Winkle, and Jeff Hayes. The audiobook is a decent length of nine hours and two minutes, but I have to say, super fans of the Ink Slinger, known as the most harmonious of Coopers, you will want to hunker down and prepare your ears for an oral, that's A-U, not O-R, feast that you know is very super sweet. Cherry sweet, in fact. A bald biker with several piercings swung his pool stick at Veronique. Grace stopped him mid-swing, and the towering brute turned to his compadres, his mind now hers. Gary, what the hell are you doing? One of the men cried as his former friend swung his pool stick at the shortest guy in the group. With three engaged or down, one of the last members of the biker gang pulled a gun. I don't know what the hell you two are, but this ends now. Except it didn't. The tiny screws holding the gun together unraveled, and his weapon fell apart in his hands. He started to back away, but Veronique pulled him over to her using the metal on his belt and the buckles on his boots. The final biker, still standing, turned to the door, a fire lit under his ass. Grace? I nodded at the man trying to escape, and he stopped, turned toward a pool table, and lay down on it. Make sure he isn't drunk. I reminded Veronique as she stood before the gunless man who was now on his knees. I'd seen what happened if she took the life force of a drunk person. Not that I wouldn't mind another shower encounter, especially after two days of traveling with her and not quite getting the cold shoulder, yet not getting the warm shoulder either, but I wasn't ready to handle her nor Grace in a drunken state. He isn't drunk, Grace said, her eyes blazing white. Damn, she looked beautiful. The outstanding wordsmith has penned yet another tale of our super sexy cherry blossom gals, and it has set events in motion that just might mean their end. Gideon, Grace, and Veronique are out taking down bases when Mother, their evil foe, has decided that she's had enough and sends a new girl to trounce our tireless trio. She's known as the deadly Dorian Gray, who's saliva and other bodily fluids is not only corrosive but can form deadly energy animates with just a wave of her paintbrush and she is now hot on their tails can they stop her evade her beat her enslave her you gotta listen to find out the story is really fast-paced it is packed with adventure a little bit of sex here and there and excitement uh now dorian I have to say, first off, is a really cool character, and she can kick butt and chew bubblegum while painting the deadliest portraits since Vincent Van Gogh called off his ear and made a selfie. Put, put it plainly. Uh, she really fits into the mythos of the mutants in the making that Cooper has started. Uh, and there may be more to her than what we see, but you have to kind of get into the book a little bit to kind of figure out what's going on with her. We finally get to learn how Veronique eats. Yeah. And that both she and Grace, or Sabine if you prefer, have actually unknowingly had their abilities toned down a little bit. Now, just like in the first book, Cooper hits this ground running. Only he's wearing roller skates and the ground is thin ice. So you never know which way he's going to turn. And what you get and what you expect shall never meet. Uh, the fight scenes, as always, are exciting and amazing. The downtime with the girls is wet and steamy. Okay, if you like that sort of stuff, it's, it's steamy. Uh, and you get an idea of just like how Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four feels when he is intimate with his wife. And she goes all translucent. Uh, you will also realize, very sadly, that no matter how great your bathroom is, your showers will never, ever compare to Gideon's. And by the way, I loved the shout out to the Proxima gaming system that he included. Now, if he could just sneak in a cameo of Mama Hughes, I would be a really happy, happy fanboy. I do like that he has created this melded world so that this ties in with feedback and Proxima and, you know, you name anything he's written so far, 90% of it does come back to the same place. So it's kind of neat to have a, a shared world that may never really touch in some aspects, but it just points them out in little bits here and there. Now, the man with three first names, Justice Justin Thomas James really carries this book. I enjoyed him in book one and in Gunmeister Online. 
but I think I've heard him enough now to know that this dude can totally narrate. He carries the bulk of this book on his very powerful shoulders, and I really look forward to him doing some work on his own. In fact, I just listened to another book that he did, uh, and I think he was incredible with that too, and that was X Superheroes. So I'll, I'll be reviewing that at some point in the future. Um, the rest of the Sambu Theater acts as the supporting cast with the master of the vocal arts, forgive me, Doctor Strange, but Jeff Hayes is portraying the non-Gideon male characters, while Annie takes the roles of the Cherry Blossom Girls, and Lori Catherine Winkle is tackling the role of Dorian itself. Uh, I can't say enough about how good the sound quality is or the pure level of awesomeness that these narrators instill in their characters. But, and I'm going to say but, this is something that's really starting to feel like it's turning into an audio show or a radio play. And as much as I enjoy this, and I really do enjoy these books, um, I think I really prefer one or two narrators with my audiobooks. I mean, shoot, Jeff can play about 50 characters by himself, both male and female, without breaking a sweat. And Justin completely has the Ricola pipes to crank out some stunning syllables all by himself. Annie and Lori have established and proven track records of it extreme impressiveness. Uh, just listen to Annie, and I'm just saying go back to uh, her first book and listen to what she did. Just, it'll blow you away. Uh, now here, I, I think that this this melding of all four of them, or even layering in more people, it, it blurs the lines of the voices. And one male character and one female narrator should really suffice. Um, th but that's just me. And I'll take whatever I can get from Sound Booth Theater, honestly, and I'll happily ask for more. But I, I'm not a big fan of the, the audio play unless it's an actual audio play. And I know Sound Booth Theater likes to include uh, sound effects and a lot of other little audible tricks, which are really neat and I enjoy them. But again, I'm going to just say I, I get a little overwhelmed sometimes. I just think one or two people. And to be frank with you, I really prefer my audiobooks to be read by one person. Um, I go back to James Marsters doing the Jim Butcher uh, Dresden Files. He does every voice in that book, and every voice in that book is different, and it's enjoyable. And so I know that one person can do this. And Sound Booth really goes out of the way to make this special, and I appreciate that, and I do understand it. Uh, I just prefer one or two people at most. So I cannot wait until the next installment. Harmon Cooper, please keep it up. Bring these books out quickly. Uh, I know you're a fast writer, but I really need more. I need them back quickly. So I'm going to say my final score for this book is 8.5 out of 10. Thank you.